Good morning. Um, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery in San Ana on a Saturday morning. Um, beautiful day here at the moment. And uh, today we're going to talk about how to prepare a, a, a planting bed for your next year's project, either a vegetable garden, flower garden, orchard. Um, the better title for this is How Not to Mess Up Your Garden. Because uh, that apparently we're being all being told to do it the incorrect way. So the main thing to know about soil. So this is a sample of soil from Orange County Produce. Uh, their land, they, they lease land probably about 100 acres throughout Orange County. And the owner of the company, one of the co-owners, told me that this is the best soil they've ever farmed on. So I took a sample of it. And generally, it's a light, very light colored. Um, we analyzed it about 85% sand. And he says, you know, this is the best farmland he's been on. Um, so that's perfect. So, I mean, if you look at it, it looks 100% mineral. Now, what soil is made out of, just so you know, so soil or loam, so the term for decent soil is loam. And that just means that that soil has the main three components that make up soil, which would be uh, sand, silt, and clay. You need all three of those. Well, you need at least two of them to make a decent soil. Uh, sand, you all know what sand is, it's sand, if you look at it through a microscope, it's kind of clear because it's quartz. It's actually a quartz crystal. Now there are sands that are made out of different minerals other than quartz, but for the majority of places in the world, uh, sand is quartz. And you melt it, you get glass. Silt is just smaller sand, so sand particles tend to be roughly round. Silt, maybe one tenth the size, also roughly around. Clay is a little different. So clay is quartz or silicon dioxide, which is quartz, combined with other minerals, maybe aluminum, maybe iron, but it makes, instead of making it round, clay is little flat flakes. You can say like confetti. And the combination of these creates what plants need. So what plants do need from the soil. So we used to tell, you know, and most, um, unfortunately, most professional horticulturists will till, still tell you that the soil is, is, provides nutrition. Well, um, according to most of the researchers who have studied this, it's not the case. So the soil is the home for the plant's roots. It does what the plant roots need, which is these, all three of these things are important. You know, they need all three. So there, I shouldn't put numbers on them, but one would be moisture retention, which is intuitive. And then, um, The second is permeability, which is the ability for the soil to get air in and out of the ground so that the roots can actually breathe. So one thing to know about plants is that the green parts of the plant have the chloroplasts that contain the chlorophyll molecules that'll take carbon dioxide and water, carbon dioxide from the air, water from the soil and change that with the energy of the sunlight into sugar and oxygen. Those are the byproducts of photosynthesis, or sugar and oxygen. Um, that part of the plant creates the oxygen. The roots are just like us. They need oxygen to breathe. Um, so the oxygen, and there's no way to transport it inside the plant. The oxygen goes out into the atmosphere, goes through the soil, 
to the roots, the roots can breathe and the plant thrives. So permeability is, is certainly there. I mean, all these things, you know, they're, they're actually contrast, well, what do you call it? When one is better, the other is not. So if you hold more moisture, you usually have less permeability. If you hold, have more permeability, you usually have less moisture. There's, you know, that's, it's nice to have a, a balancing act there. And then third one is insulation. So the roots operate at a narrow range of temperatures. They like it between around 40, you know, for most temperate climate plants, around 40 degrees to about 86. For tropical plants, it might be 55 to 100. Uh, they like, so the soil insulates the roots from the high temperatures that can occur and the low temperatures at night, high temperatures in the day. So they're there, they insulate. And then we'll put down four, just stability to keep the plant in place. But for most plants, nutrition is not a part of that. So in nature, what's going on is that the soil below the surface, now documented is 99, you know, for Many generations, they've told us that the soil is 99.1% mineral, 0.9% organic. Uh, recently, in the last 20 years, I think University of Vermont, I believe, said there is no organic matter in the ground. Uh, they're, when they're doing the surveys, they're killing the roots off as they do the survey, and roots amount to that 0.9%. Uh, and they're and they're mistaken in that they, they say that soil is 100% mineral, and anything that dies in the soil naturally, uh, it's consumed immediately, and you don't really see it. So, but the on the other hand, above the ground, there's an average of five inches of organic matter on top of the ground in nature. And that's the layer where the nutrition is. The plants live down here, the nutrition is up here. Now if you mix the two together, you get into trouble because this is decomposing. Anything that's dead decomposes. I mean, there's some things that don't decompose very fast, but generally everything that's dead does decompose and when it decomposes, it uses up oxygen, gives off carbon dioxide, exactly what the roots need. So if you've got too much of this, if this layer gets too thick, I mean, it's five inches, and generally it's dead leaves that are fairly coarse. The air gets through there just fine. Uh, the soil breathes through that layer of dead stuff just fine. But if you have a compost pile, you know, that's two or three foot high sitting on top of the ground, and that's using up the oxygen, uh, there's no way this ground's going to get any. And if you mix that compost into the ground, it's not done decomposing yet. And if, you know, you don't put compost in the ground to make it compost properly. If you bury compost, you get poison gases forming because of the lack of oxygen. It can't decompose properly and suddenly you're getting sewer gases, which are totally toxic to roots forming. And nobody seems to get that, that you put that, you know, that planter mix you get, you know, on the bag, they might claim it's finished compost. So it no longer decomposes. That's not the case. I mean, if it was finished compost, it would be carbon dioxide and water. That's what happens to compost when it's done. Carbon dioxide, water, and a few minerals. But if you bury a bunch of dead stuff down here, it's going to continue to decompose or try to decompose uh, and if there's not enough oxygens, it makes sewer gases, which are pretty much lethal to the roots of plants. I mean, you know, they, they know in landfills where they've covered up organic matter, you know, they've got to put pipes down there, release the methane and all those gases that are forming down in the ground. And if you put compost in the ground, you're going to get the same problem. Um, now, if your soil is really, really sandy, and breathe really, really well, you might get away with some of that compost in the ground. Especially if your soil looks like this on the farm here, 85% sand, 
you can probably get away with a little bit of compost in there without lowering the oxygen level at all. But if you lower the oxygen level, you get root rot. Root rot is the main thing caused by lack of oxygen. And unfortunately, we have, you know, the professionals in industry don't get this. So especially, you know, we, we can't blame them, but the people that sell bulk soil to our customers, we've had quite a few of them say, well, they bought this bulk soil to, to fill their, all their planters up and they made it 60% uh, loam and 40% compost versus in nature where it's 0.9 or less. Now, University of California actually went around the farms in the year 2000. They wanted to see where the farmers were at because they, they had considered that nature it was 99.1. You need that 0.9% because it is important. Uh, so they went around the farms and checked them, and they said, boy, the farms in California are perfect. They're averaging 1.1% organic matter. That's about what that looks like. You, don't, you can't see it. That means that one particle out of every 100 particles in there is organic matter. Yet what we're being sold on these bags of planter mix that they tell you to buy, mix it 50-50 with your garden. Now they, the University of California did mention that there are some farms in the Delta region near Sacramento, the Central Valley Delta region, that are reclaimed marshland. And some of those reclaimed marshlands are 40% organic. Just the dead reeds and grasses that are in there uh, and they said those farms cannot grow anything perennial. That is, they can't grow a crop that lasts more than a few months. And they have to manage their watering very carefully because everything tends to rot. So that's what happens when you have a lot of organic matter in the ground. Things tend to want to rot, if you, especially if you don't control your watering. So if, you, if the soil, if you water too much, what happens is that the soil gets saturated, which means there's no air pockets in there left. So when the soil is really wet, when it's shiny, uh, the air can't really pass through easily. It's, the water is still there. The water can bring oxygen in from the surface down, but it's blocked. You know, when you have all these soil particles mixed with the water, the uh, way that oxygen moves through the soil is very, very slow that way. And if it's saturated, there's no air pockets for the air to get through faster. So when it's saturated and you've got organic matter in there, boy, you, go, you can go um, septic or sewer gases form very quickly. Whereas if you keep it on the dry side, so there's, there's air pockets in the ground, that helps alleviate that. But, you know, it's hard to control the, the rains in the winter uh, and if you're not really careful with your watering, then everything's rotting. On the other hand, if you don't have any organic matter in the ground, it's really hard to promote root rot. Really difficult. I mean, they'd have to be underwater for a week at a time. So. Did the displacement of water bring oxygen into the root? Oh, yes. That's true. If you've got good drainage, your tap water's got enough oxygen in it. Rainwater has plenty of oxygen. Our tap water, by law, by the rules that the water districts use, has to be enough oxygen in there to, you know, so if you put in your fish tank, then kill the fish. Uh, it's five, what it is is, the minimum is five to seven parts per million oxygen per, that, you know, that's, means that there's five to seven oxygen molecules per million water molecules. That's the range that the water districts have to keep their water at. I don't know what rainwater is. I, and I keep checking rainwater on the internet to see if it says how much parts per million, but I've, it probably depends on the temperature of the water. You know, hot water holds less oxygen than cold water. So rain in the middle of winter would have more oxygen than rain in the middle of summer or in the tropics. Uh, but I, I don't know how much auction rainwater has. 
And some plants can go down to about three parts per million before they suffocate. So the best plants apparently are tomatoes, pear trees, apple trees, those I know about. I would imagine lilies, daisies, grasses are in that same range because those refuse to root rot. Whereas, you know, some of the things that need a lot of oxygen, orchids, ferns, um, avocado trees, you know, those things root rot real easily if you drop below, much below that. So. One of the best plants we've seen for, you, for a test, if you want, is strawberries. So, um, in the old days, before we knew much about soil, we used the organic potting soils, and the strawberry plants used to have leaves about a quarter that size, and the plants only grew about eight inches wide, and the strawberries were as big as my thumbnail, and I thought that was proper, because in the potting soils we were being, you know, they, they were available to us in the 1980s. That's how big they grew. And then, you know, we'd always wondered why on farms they plant strawberry plants 18 inches apart when they only grow like this. And then we got a pot of sand, you know, we're, so when we finally were alerted by this, by a scientist that everything in the nursery industry was wrong, uh, we grew strawberries in a pot of sand and we got, now this plant's kind of young yet, so it's not at full size. It's been in here a month and a half, but we had a pot of sand in a little bit bigger pot than this and the plant ended up two foot across with leaves a little bigger than these. I mean, this is just about full size, but uh, a strawberry plant is a great plant to check your oxygen availability in your soil. If you got a lot of oxygen, they'll grow two foot across. If you don't have enough oxygen, they'll be real small. They would doesn't kill them, it seems like, but they just do not perform well in low oxygenated soils. Another good test plant would be pansies this time of year. Pansies rot out real quick if you don't have enough oxygen in the ground. So. Petunias also rot real easy if you don't have enough oxygen in the ground. So, okay, so they like the mineral soils. Now, the there's a lot of different kinds of soils. Of course, you can have a real sandy soil like that was on a farm, but most soils aren't this good. Now, in Orange County. The sandy soils are usually below these foothills, the interior foothills here, uh, and above the five freeway. So you got Anaheim, you got this part of Santa Ana, you've got that part of Tustin, uh, down into Irvine. This is from Irvine, uh, between the five freeway and uh, uh, Irvine Boulevard. You get too much close to Portola Park where you get into the foothills. That's, so the foothills around here are what are called sandy clay. They have a lot of sand in them, but they've got too much clay. Um, okay, let's go to this. So this tells you how soil works. So pretend the tennis balls are the sand. Now it's a little off, the relative sizes are off. In this demonstration, the sand should actually be the size of uh, bowling balls. And then the uh, ping pong balls, table tennis balls would, would be the silt. And then these lentil seeds would be the clay. Um, again, confetti would probably be a little better illustration, but this flows better in the, in the sample. So anyway, so soil is a conglomeration of those three particles. Now, all soil particles have a, what is it, negative charge. So apparently quartz has a negative charge. Uh, so all these soil particles have a negative charge. And so they have a charge on them. And 
water is a charged molecule. Water molecules, oxygen on one side, hydrogen on the other side. This is plus on this side, this is negative on this side. So they are attracted to anything that's got a charge on it, at least really powerfully one layer thick. So every particle on this thing will attract water to it really strongly one molecule thick. Well, the smallest particles, clay, have the largest surface area for their size, because this is all solid, but these could only be, they said, 28 layers of molecules thick, the clay, so that they have relatively more size on them uh, to hold that water. Whereas sand particles, uh, very little of it can hold water, just the outer surface can. Uh, clay holds a lot more water. So if you had and so that's how they attract water, and clay holds more water than sand because of its larger surface areas for the size. Uh, if, you, if you know geometry at all, the surface of a cube is, has six sides. Uh, if you make the cubes half the, si half the length on the side, you'll have four times more cubes that are smaller but with six sides there's actually double the surface area when you half the size of the particle. If you know geometry that is correct. So the smaller the particles the more surface area and what we find is that if you have pure sand soil say a foot deep of pure sand it only take about a half inch of water a place on the surface to totally saturate the sand where it can't hold anymore and starts dripping out the bottom. If you've got a foot of clay, it may hold on to two over two inches of water before you get all the clay wet. So clay can hold, what, five times more water than sand. Now, there's a lot of different sizes of sand. The coarser sand, the less water can hold. Uh, and clay, there's a lot of different types of clay too. So, but on average, you know, clay holds five times more, much more water than sand. Sand will breathe a heck of a lot better. So if you have soil, the, the air space is between the particles. The bigger the air space, it's the size of the space, the better the airflow. Because when the spaces get smaller, there's a lot more friction. The air doesn't get through very well. So in sandy soils, the airflow is great. With clay soils, it is really tough to get that air through there. So, and if there's water on top of that, in the clay soil, there may not be any air space at all left. So, now, the other thing to know is that, again, sand and silt are relatively round particles. When you have spheres, the space between a perfect spheres represents 33% of the volume. So the spheres are taking up two thirds of the volume, the airspace one third. If the clay in the soil is more than one third the total amount of soil, that'll fill all those air spaces up that the sand and the silt make. So it doesn't take much clay to totally block off the airflow in this soil. So the the sandy clay that's up on the hills back here, may, it might be 40% sand. But if it's 40% clay on top of that, it doesn't breathe. It doesn't take much clay to mess up perfectly good sandy soil. Pardon? Oh. Well, there's a... a a coarse test to figure out what you have. So this is what we do. It's not perfect, but it's close. So you fill a jar half with your soil. This is filled with that. Add water to the neck. This has been evaporating, so it's dropping down. About two or three drops of soap in there, like Dawn or Joy or Ivory, and shake it up really good. You gotta make sure all these particles are broken down into their simple sand, salt, and clay. So shake, you know, a couple minutes, just shake that. You might have to do it a couple of days in a row. Shake it up, let it sit, let shake it up, and then just set it down. 
And what happens is that sand has the least amount of surface area for its weight. And it'll just fall to the bottom really fast. And then, and you can see the sand. And then the silt, which is smaller than sand, will fall right on top of it. The clay will stay in suspension in the water overnight and slowly settle down the next day and form a real creamy layer on top of that. So in this sample, if you were really close to it, you can see the sand goes all the way up to here. There's a really thin clay layer, less than an eighth of an inch at the very surface. You can kind of see the, the creamy stuff floating around there. And then between the clay and the sand is, is a layer that is a silt layer that's kind of, it doesn't look quite grainy enough to be sand. Got new, new, new professors here for our class. Um, but anyway, um, that's how you would test it generally. And people have brought in their samples of clay and you can see that clay layer on top is like that thick. the size and the weight falls to the bottom first. So you can, that, that's a rough, I mean, some of the silt mixes with the sand, some of the clay mixes with the silt. It, it's, you know, so it, it's not perfect, but it gives you a general idea. And this, you know, this and that um, shows it pretty well that this soil from the farm is very, very sandy, so. So if you have uh, what we would call the ideal sandy loam, in this case it was about 85% sand, which is really high. I mean, it doesn't have to be anywhere close to that, but that, that was about 85% sand and maybe 8% clay. And the rest of it is what, uh, 93, 7% silt. I mean, again, the clay and the silver are probably higher. We, in this test, we couldn't get any better than that. Um, but that's a very sandy soil. It has hardly enough clay to make it hold enough water. A rich loam would be much higher in clay. The clay would be more like 20% clay. Uh, and maybe, you know, and other numbers, so this could be 40% sand. That would leave 40% silt also. But clay would be anything over about 33% clay. So the way that the soil moves around and the way Orange County got created here is that the mounds and the hills here, the rain moves the soil off those hills into the stream beds. The stream beds carry it to the ocean, but the thing that drops out first from these hills is the sand. It's heavier. So just below the hills, we have this real sandy soil. And then as you go out to the ocean and the river slows down, then the clay starts falling out. That's why parts of Costa Mesa, Fountain Valley, Los Alamitos, this muck really clay. Now if you're right along the riverbeds there, a lot of that sand still comes down to that area. So if you're close to the rivers, the major rivers, you've got sandy soil. But if you're further out where they, you know, in, 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 his, in the, a long time ago, they didn't have the banks there and the rivers would overflow in the winter and the clay would just go out sideways and cover the ground. And that's how you got your clay soils there. There's a lot of clay out in the ocean just below the riverbeds where the rivers enter into it. So what's interesting is that 150 years ago, the farmers were all in Los Alamitos and Fountain Valley because that was considered the rich loam. Now, if you were in this soil in the 1800s, farmer looked at it and said, that thing's bone dry. How do I get water into that? And they go out to Fountain Valley and Costa Mesa after the winter rains are over. It's all muddy. Oh, we can grow a crop in this. So that was, you know, the old definition in the 1800s of rich soil was clay soil. 
You know, the farmers near the riverbeds had the rich clay farmland, and the farmers on the hills were in that real rocky, sandy stuff that was considered the poor land in those days. So. Well, what they found out is if you water sand versus clay, plants grow faster where they have more oxygen availability to the roots. So this now is with the technology we have to irrigate daily or even more than that, this becomes a better farm soil. And you know, to the other extreme, um, I didn't bring the sample here. The more air you get to the roots, the faster things grow. So all the, the most expensive crop in the world, which is marijuana, is not grown in soil at all. It's grown in, you know, either um, sponge rock or even more so clay pebbles. I don't know if you've seen that. I have a sample here. Let me bring it over. So if you want to grow a plant the very fastest way you can, you grow it in this. So this is clay fired into little pellets so that there's good airflow there and the clay holds the water. Oh, it's fired. So it, it holds its shape. Of course, they still water this. You know, this is in greenhouses or in, you know, warehouses with artificial lighting. And then they'll water this every few hours, you know. So the, so the main thing is maximum oxygen to the roots, maximum water to the roots, and you've got the fastest growth you can get. You can just have to water more. Well, that this is a hydroponic thing. Yeah, so hydroponics, they use this, they use sponge rock, uh, they'll use pumice rock, um, you know, they use uh, plastic foam, they use rock wool, which is spun glass. You know, there are a lot of things they'll use, but the main things, you know, you need some support, but you want, uh, you don't need insulation in, in greenhouse. You need primarily oxygen, you know, airflow, and moisture retention, well, moisture retention greenhouse. Greenhouses are humid, you just, and you can water them as often as you like. The technology is there to do that. So this gets you the faster growth, more vigorous growth. But this is expensive material. So, but it's also permanent. <laughs> so. Now, just so you know, farms do turn organic matter into the soil, but it's at a very low rate. So they know that organic matter, you know, modern farms, the, well, conventional farms, they can't put compost on top of the ground because of the equipment they use to harvest and till and all that. It would just keep tilling it in. Uh, but they do use a little bit, you know, nothing, you know, they don't do five inches. Like in nature, they just put on a, a little bit every year and they have to till it in because if they don't till it in, it just blows down the street and it's gone. So we've seen this farm when they do that, they do it once a year, they bring in a truckload, truck, truckload after truckload of compost and they spread it out. But when they spread it out, it's like that thick. You can see it on top of this because it's black, but it's, I believe they use five cubic yards per acre. And five cubic yards, if you spread that out over an acre, it's really thin. <laughs> yeah, that's what nature intended. So you want a layer of compost top. You don't want to mix it with the soil below. That's the tricky part. You don't want to mix it in uh, to the soil below it if you can help it, because it doesn't belong there. 
But uh, farms, they, you know, the conventional farms, that's the problem they're having with them because they're using big equipment and they cannot avoid mixing it together. Uh, so they have to only put on a small amount and then they have to fertilize other methods. Whereas some of the newer, you know, some of the smaller farms, they'll pile it on. We, we listened to a seminar from a farm, a family farm up in Washington. And they said, we keep one foot of compost or dead stuff on top of their row crops. And whenever they plant, they move it aside, plant their crop. As it grows, they push it back onto it. So they're doing it exactly what nature wants. Well, they're doing even deeper than nature. Well, nature can be anywhere from nothing to, we've heard five feet of dead leaves on top of the ground underneath some trees that people have seen. So, um, Less sticky. Yeah, so you really can't change clay soil by doing anything to it, but you can. Would that, well, okay, so the problem with clay is it's too fine textured. No gaps between the little tiny particles, the caps are too small. So if you put organic matter in the ground, what happens is as they break down, so organic matter is primarily cellulose, the material that plants are made out of cellulose is a string of sugar molecules that we can't eat. It's been rearranged, so we can't eat it. Uh, the only thing that can eat cellulose are bacteria that we know of. Uh, so any animal that eats cellulose is he actually has bacteria in their gut. Termites have to have bacteria in their gut. Cows have to have this bacteria in their gut to um, and beavers have bacteria in their guts to break down the silos into sugars. Uh, now beavers have the worst, I mean, I would not want to be a beaver because it says what they have to do. They don't have two stomachs like cows do. <laughs> so what they do is they eat their food, the bacteria starts breaking down the sugars, they poop it out and then they have to eat it again to get the sugars that that the bacteria had created. So, uh, you know, you don't want to come back in second life as a beaver. That's not a pleasant thing to have to do. But um, anyway, that's... So the thing that holds the cellulose strands together in the plant tissue is a glue called lignin. Lignin's also a rearranged sugar molecule, but it never changes. Nothing eats lignin. Lignin is the glue that's released from the decomposing cellulose and it's free in the ground. And when it hits the, the clay particles, it starts gluing them together to be bigger particles. So they call it granulation of the soil, aggregation of the soil particles. It clumps them so that the clay particles start acting like sand particles. And if you ever put um, like one of the most decomposed products out there is I don't know if it's still being sold, nitrohumus by Kellogg's. I remember I laid some on the ground, and then a, a few weeks later I moved it aside, and all the soil below it looked like little pills. It, the stuff from the nitrohumus, which is highly digested sludge, uh, just made all these little pills out of the dirt in my yard. So it glued them all together. So that's so if you do that and leave it there it'll constantly do that thing where it uh, takes the soil particles and glues them together. But it's really hard to change clay. I mean, now, you know, when you know that sand, soil, and clay are parts of every soil, if you have clay soil, you might be able to add, well, I was told by the ag department that no clay soils have more than, say, 60% clay in Orange County in them. So there's no pure clay in Orange County. And they told me that at 60%, 50% clay, if you were to increase the amount of sand by equal amounts, in other words, for a foot of this clay soil, you added another foot of sandy soil and you mix them together, the soil will breathe. They said you'll knock the clay content below 30%, and the soil will actually breathe, act like sandy, uh, by like a rich loam soil and actually breathe. But that's going to be difficult if you have a yard 
and then you want to improve the soil a foot and a half deep, that means you have to add a, a foot and a half more sand to your whole yard and it'll be a foot and a half higher. Now, if you have raised beds, you can do that. Yeah, but yeah, it's very salty. Yeah, but it's illegal to take sand off the beach. So most of the sand being sold is from the riverbeds in Orange County, or, you know, local riverbeds. They just pull the sand out of there. So, so that's one option. If you want to improve your clay, you add sand to it. Now, the research shows that pumice is more efficient than sand because they said pumice has air holes in it. So pumice is 70% air. They said if you made pure 100% clay, 20% pumice, you'll have rock-to-rock -rock contact, and the air can still get through. I I don't know if it's quite as efficient as they say it is, but uh, uh, that's what the research is telling us that you can have pure clay, 20% pumice added. So you need to add less pumice than you would sand. Pumice is like three times more expensive than sand, so that's the downfall. You, you can add a lot less pumice, but the cost is higher. So that's one way to make the sand. Now, you can't make clay soil drain better, so don't even try. I mean, you know, you, if you add sand to clay soil, it's like throwing sand in a, in the, in a cement pond or in, in your swimming pool. It doesn't make the swimming pool drain to add sand to your swimming pool. You can't make, if it's, clay is not going to drain, it's just not going to drain. I had a yard like that at my last house, so um, I knew the, ge I know the geologist who did that section of Mission Vale in those days, so they had found out in the 80s to avoid sliding slopes. The main thing to do was to cover the ground with two foot of really compacted clay highly compacted clay so that it won't absorb any water so it won't saturate the hill and the hill won't slide. So my front yard was sandy soil. It was just like the sandy stuff. But within 20 foot of the edge of my back property, which I had two sides on the, that were on hill edges, essentially my entire backyard <laughs> was this deep and solid clay. I mean, just, you know, shovels and picks would just bounce off of that thing because they had packed it down so hard. So the only thing I do in my backyard was build upwards. There's just no way, he says, there's no way you can dig in that. We just packed it as hard. You know, the earth moving equipment was on my property when they're building my house, I saw it. And, uh, you know, there's these monster machines that were packing it down. So we knew that uh, it was gonna be a problem. So all we did was build upwards. So the nice thing about building upwards on clay is clay will absorb the excess water. Because clay is like blotter paper. The finer the, the uh, texture of it, the more water is retained by it. So clay will absorb water from sandy soils. It doesn't do the other way. So sandy soils um, below clay, the water stays up in the clay. And that's one of the problems they had. I believe it was Bluebird Canyon, Laguna Beach. They said what they have there is sand, a layer of clay, and then more sand below that. And if you get enough saturation in that sand, it makes the clay layer really wet. But then the sand below the clay won't absorb the water. So they, essentially what they had was sandy soil on top of a layer of clay that became essentially a layer of grease between those two layers of sand and the whole hill just slid when we had the real heavy rains i think that was back in the 80s and that whole top just slid off uh, so you, you know having clay on top of sand is a bad thing but for people who have clay soil yeah if you just want to put sandy soil on top of it that works really well because the excess water will be pulled down into the clay. So the other thing you know is, you know, in clay soils, the roots on plants will go as deep as the air penetration goes. So if you have a lot of clay in your ground, you may only get air penetration down about, or root penetration down about eight inches. 
if you have sandy soil, it can go down several feet. And if the and if the plants don't need much oxygen, like grass plants, those roots can go really deep. I mean, uh, up in Ventura, when they're first testing some of the fescue grasses, and they have sandy soil, and though on the grass farm, uh, sod farm, they said that the roots went down nine feet. Well. Back in the 80s, they're promoting nine foot depth on this grass root. And I planted my yard and I pulled the sod after a couple of years and it was like this much. <laughs> I was going, to, they lied. It doesn't go down nine feet, it goes down th three inches. Now, the fault I did was that in those days in the 80s, they told us put four inches of compost and till it into your soil to, to prepare your lawn for grass. So we did that. We put a whole bunch of compost in the ground to make that soil really, in theory, really rich. And my grass roots would only go in that deep because they couldn't breathe any deeper than that in that compost-filled soil. It didn't kill the grass because the grass can get by with real low oxygen levels, but boy, it was really shallow rooted. So. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. So if you want to, you know, want, you got several ways. If you if you're stuck with really bad clay and you don't want to amend the clay, uh, some of our customers have just removed. You know, they have a company come in with a bobcat bobcat tractor and remove a foot of that soil and bring in a foot of good soil. And I've had a few customers say they removed two foot. Now on good farmland, this could be well over 10 foot deep. I mean, in this section of Irvine, we're watching them do, you know, when they were making the housing around there, we're watching these earth movers moving the soil and they were way down there in that hole. They're still bringing the same soil up out of that hole. So that is really deep soil where this farm is and farmers like it. They said, if we can get soil that's five foot deep of sandy loam, we're in heaven. Because that thing just drains forever. So those must be sections of Irvine, correct? Right. These are oh yeah, you get, any, you get close to the 405 freeway, it's all clay. Where I grew up in Irvine, in the orange groves, literally in the orange groves, that seemed like it was just compacted clay. Yeah. So the, one of the rules they have is, you got soil like this, you grow avocados. You got clay soil, you grow citrus. And citrus can take the clay soil, avocados not so much. So. And I would notice when they would demo the orange fields to build homes on there, they pull up, those roots weren't deep, they just fan out in right. the surface. Right, right, they go as deep as they can breathe. So in clay soils, you're real close to the surface in the sandy soils, they can go deeper, but they say even the average tree in a forest, they said foot and a half is about it. So even in the best soils in nature, foot and a half is about it, unless you're in really coarse sand. I mean, they say if you're in a, a real steep canyon and it's filled with gravel, you can find tree roots 20 foot down in that gravel. So wherever the roots can breathe, they can, they can go and search for water. A friend of mine, the friend of mine who is a geologist, says they've worked in uh, fractured fault zones, and they find roots 200 foot deep where there's an earthquake fault because it's all fractured, and the air can get down there, and they'll find roots all the way down those things. And of course, if you've been in the volcano, of, what do you call it, the volcanic tubes in Hawaii, and there's roots hanging through that, going right through that volcanic rock because it's all pumice, and the roots can breathe. I don't know how. You know, it's hard to tell when you're in those volcanic tubes how close you are to the surface, but um, those roots can go all the way into those those tubes. So, um, so auction availability. Um, so in you know, so in sandy soils, it doesn't hold as much water per foot, but the roots can go down a lot deeper. In clay soils, it holds way more water per foot. But the roots can't go down as far, so it's even. If you have sandy soil, you've probably got as good moisture retention as you do in clay, 
given time, you know, get the plant's roots down there so they can pick up the moisture in the sandy soils. But clay soils, right off the bat, hold more water. Uh, now, clay soils are not poisonous to plants as long as they're not set up in an unusual situation. In other words, if you've got clay soil and you start a plant by seed or by a little plant that's near the surface, its roots will just grow right where they can breathe. But if you take a big box tree and you stick it in the ground in a clay soil and the roots are a foot and a half, almost two foot deep, and you bury it with clay around it, it's, you're going to lose a lot of this root system because it can't breathe. You've just put it down too deep. And the other problem we have in our industry is that all the plants that we know of are being grown in organic matter that decomposes. We don't know of any grower. There might be a few out there that only use peat moss, but most growers use some kind of wood product, which is fresh enough to decompose fast. They put it in the soil mix under the advice of our college academia. to use wood product or some kind of um, a freshly killed tree somewhere in the soil mix because they feel that without it the soil is too, there's not enough nutrients in it to allow a plant to grow. Zero. Zero nature, know, nature knows how to do it. No, meaning like if you wanted to fill it into the soil without suffocating the, the roots and having all that decomposition under the ground. Well, it's got to be gone before that, that happens. <laughs> you're saying if it, if it decomposes to the point where it's safe to do that? It's, it's gone. gone. Yeah, it's, it's not there anymore. I so, I mean, in nature, nothing buries itself. I mean, it very seldom do things bury themselves in nature. You know, dead, you know, especially trees. I mean, trees stand there dead for decades and they fall over and they lie there decaying for a long time. You know, if you, you know, compost is such an artificial thing that we've created. It's like what tree in nature grinds itself into pieces that big. And then because of that, there's so much more surface area on these. You know, if you have a piece of wood and you throw it in a pond, it, it can be there for years because it's there's this one surface area on it. But if you take that same piece of wood and break it into a million parts, suddenly there's so much surface area, it decomposes in weeks, not years. So the compost that we make is totally, you know, there's nothing like it in nature that I know of. Right. Right. But how is that possible then? Well, it can fall. Okay. So as long as you got the oxygen getting in there, it can still work. So like when organic matter is really fresh, I don't have a sample of it here, but you know, fresh compost, it's got plenty of airflow. So that's why a lot of companies grow plants in containers in compost because when they did the research. They found if you fill this with freshly ground up bark that's been hot decomposed for three months, it takes three months to get the real quick decomposition out of that bark, then they can put in a pot and for the next five months, this is like a perfect growing medium for this young plant in that when, it, when bark is really fresh, it doesn't have a whole much water at all, but that little tiny plant's not needing much, plenty of air. As this plant grows and this thing decomposes, it starts holding more and more water. The plant needs more, so it's still okay. But they found out that at eight months, this becomes a toxic medium because it doesn't breathe enough anymore. And uh, so they said, you know, you got to have your plant sold before eight months. Um, you know, if you surround it with sandy soil, you, you have a good chance of this plant will survive. If you go into clay, it's just going to die. 
Uh, if you leave it in the pot, it's going to die because the pot doesn't breathe like sand does. So that's, you know, but most nurseries in the United States, they only hold their plants in the container. And I shouldn't go in this way because this is next week's thing. But they don't keep their plants for more than four or five months because in most places in the United States, if you leave a plant in a container over winter, it freezes to death. So they have to have it out of their store by September, October into somebody's yard, into the dirt in their yard. And the nurseries never see this problem. In Southern California, we've been growing plants in pots year round for generations. We see this. It's in, in our nursery for six months, it starts to look terrible. And it's dead after a year unless we take all this stuff off and change it to something else that doesn't do that. But they don't get it. They don't get, they think that this stuff, you know, you put that in the ground, it becomes oxygen and carbon dioxide and water. It, it totally is gone and replaced by dirt. That's only if you have sandy soil, but if you got clay soil, this becomes sewage sludge in the ground and, and your plant's gone. And they'll say, you watered that too much. So in, in your soil, you know, if you don't have too much organic matter in it, hardly anything will ever have problems from overwater. Overwatering was, that whole term was invented in the 1980s. First time we had heard it was the 1980s when everybody started switching to organic matter in the pots my dad called me in, in the ag department, he says, I've watered every, all my plants every day for the last 30 years, now they're all rotting. What's going on? And told him, you water too much. That's the only explanation they had. Because they couldn't go back on what they told them to do, put organic matter in the soil, and, that, and they couldn't figure it out. I mean, it's like these smart, people who are supposed to be telling us couldn't figure out that this was causing the root rot, not the water. I mean, you know, in Central Valley and the farms, when we had the rain last winter, all the farmers just turned on their, you know, the rivers were all full, they just turned on their pumps. They're trying to re um, get those groundwater tables back, filled back up again. So they just filled their orchards with water, filled the grapevines with water. The water wasn't hurting their plants. There was plenty of oxygen in that rainwater that they had in those rivers. They just flooded them, kept them flooded all winter long to help recharge that groundwater. But if you got compost in there, you're dead. Compost and water is really nasty. So, um, but anyway, so your options. You can work with now. You can work with clay if you if you want to make clay act as good as sandy soil. There are things you can do that you don't have to change it. So, like in Irvine, they grow strawberries. They grow strawberries that's like this in this soil, and they strawberries grow faster if they create really well good aeration, which is you know kind of equivalent to drainage. So what they do there is they raise those beds 18 inches. So 18 inches in height with this sandy loam, they put the strawberries up here. They water uh, with drip irrigation alongside these strawberry plants. They get great strawberries. Now in Monterey area, the central coast area, they grow strawberries there too. They got clay soil near the coast. Thirty-six inches. They raise that clay up to get somewhat equivalent drainage, and they get on eighteen inches on that. Thirty-six inches on clay. If you look at some of those farms, they have videos on the internet. They show kids running through the farms. You can see this much of their heads as they run through the field because they raise that. Clay. You know, they cover this with plastic so the rain won't wash it down. But um, thirty-six inches. So if you build raised planters, you can fill them with clay soil. It still works. So the higher you raise that clay, the better it drains. The water is pulled downwards to essentially the soil surface level. And when it's pulled downwards, the air is pulled in behind it. So that's what makes it breathe better, is that you raise it up, the water is pulled down, the air is pulled back in behind it. Fill it with the same soil. 
Mm -hmm. You don't have to drill it like they tell us. You right. Garden. Right, but it might just be easier to make, you know, in your garden, make raised beds and fill them with perfect soil. So if you if you purchase soil, uh, the main thing we warn people is do not buy anything that's called topsoil unless you absolutely know it's got no organic matter in it. Because the farms think, I mean, these soil companies, they you know, they know tractors, they know tr dump trucks. They know nothing about growing plants. And they think that, you know, natural topsoil is only 1% organic or less, that if they make it a lot richer, then it's even better topsoil. So what we're seeing out there is 40% organic, to 50% organic matter in topsoil. Now there's one company up here that doesn't do that at all. They just sell real topsoil. That's Blue Ribbon up here on uh, Santo Canyon Road where, what is that street? I can't remember the name of that side street. It's near Cannon. But their topsoil is just good proper sandy loam. But most other companies, 40%, 50% organic now, I've been told by the companies that do this that it grows great tomatoes. That's how they test their soil. Well, tomatoes are the only plant we know of that can grow in a compost pile. Compost piles are toxic to any other plant life except for tomatoes. So, so they use tomatoes to check out to see if this 40 or 50 percent is great for their to sell, and that's how they check it. If they put strawberries in there, that would be a better test. But they use tomato plants, and they'll grow in pure 100% compost. We've seen them grown in 100% chicken manure. You know, they don't, tomatoes are really strong plants. So you have to be really careful. If you add topsoil and fill up a bunch of beds with that, you're going to have to end up throwing it away. You can't get this amount of compost or organic matter sold down low enough uh, unless you know you made the beds like five times ten times higher than that get that organic uh, content down low enough so that you can grow plants in it because we have people that do this all the time and we've seen the results they said the roots go down that far the first crop is great because the compost is still relatively fresh and it's just been turned over. A lot of oxygen there, but subsequent crops just don't do a thing. Tomatoes do fine. I mean, I've seen it. Tomatoes do fine. Nothing else is growing. Well, if you get the air back in there, yeah, if you get the air back in there, it's okay for a while. So, you know, if you keep adding fresh organic matter in it and it's coarse, you can still create those air pockets, but you're in a, you know, you're going the wrong way. I mean, it's, it's ultimately it'll be so much sludge in there after a while that, uh, now again, if you keep turning it and keep aerating it constantly, then you know, it, it can decompose properly. So. Yeah. I mean, we learned this because we, this was like 30 years ago, I didn't know enough about dirt. So I had all these raised planters fill. I needed 17 truckloads for my raised planters, 170 cubic yards. They told me this 40% organic was the best thing to use in there. So I filled them up. Plants initially did fine, but within six months, things started rotting and falling over. I mean, I wasn't using it just for vegetables. I was putting fruit trees in it, and they were falling over. You know, bananas were just rotting and falling out of that dirt. I'm going, am I watering too much? And then I spoke with the, a true soil scientist. He says, there's no organic matter in the ground. So... So we started doing all our testing and sand beat all, you know, and sand in pots beat anything else we could try in there, except the weight in a pot is a problem. In the ground, it's not. So if you want to put sand in these raised beds, 
Uh, you could put, of course, the farmer would prefer sandy loam, or the other option is decomposed granite. So if you have raised beds, or if, if, if you're just replacing your soil or adding on top of it, you can use sand, you can use sandy loam, you can use decomposed granite, rather than you know putting more something more expensive like pumice in there, which you could do that too. Um, now, the one thing I've noted is that sandy loam is usually mined out of, dug out of riverbeds. Decomposed granite is similar makeup to sandy loam, except this hasn't been in a river yet, so the particles are bigger and they're still kind of combined with the clay. It's not been separated out. So decomposed granite hasn't been in a river yet, and sandy loam has. This, so far, hasn't had, all the samples I've seen, haven't grown weeds because apparently their mine is deep enough that there's no weed content in here. Whereas this, often you get a pile of sandy loam, you got a lot of riverbed, riverside weeds growing in there. The seeds are left behind. And some of them are really nasty, like nutgrass. So I'm, I'm actually changing my recommendation from sandy loam, unless you know the source, unless the company who has the sandy loam knows the source and it doesn't have weed seed in it, to decompose granite. We have a lot of people who like decomposed granite um, a lot. And if you go to Fallbrook or Vista, um, Escondido, well, Fallbrook, essentially, all the farms there are in this. And farms do like this. They do say decomposed granite because it hasn't been washed out by river, has a few of the natural minerals that plants need still in it. Whereas this stuff has been cleaned up. You know, most of the minerals have been washed through on that. Do you want the, uh, the soil to uh, absorb or retain the fertilizer? Or is that, um, am I not understanding that correctly? If you fertilize, the roots would just soak that, soak that up and use that. So is there any thought to uh, soil actually retaining so charcoal is, is what makes the rich black soils of the world rich in black. So um, the scientists, and this was an article in National Geographic, the year 2000, they had a soil article. They said the rich black soils of the world are rich and black because they have a charcoal content of somewhere up to 3%. They said it doesn't take much charcoal to make the soil look black. This takes a little bit, but charcoal is nature's way to store minerals. That's why we use charcoal as filters. You put charcoal filter on the water and all the minerals stick to the charcoal. Won't let things through. Uh, organic matter, um, soil organisms, the amoeba bacteria love to live near charcoal for some reason. It, uh, so, and charcoal is permanent. It's an organic material that is not broken down in nature at all you know, except making it smaller pieces as it grinds it up. But uh, it's formed when you have a really high temperatures without enough oxygen. So, you know, on the sides of volcanoes in Italy, a lot of charcoal there because those volcanic plumes that came down off, you know, like Mount Vesuvius, Pompeii, all carbon dioxide, super high heat, this incinerated the trees, turned them to charcoal. They, if there's no oxygen, they can't, turn to ash, they just go to charcoal. So that's why those slopes are so rich, because it's all charcoal. It's all black charcoal. So the fertilizer wouldn't get locked up in that charcoal? The, the roots can... They can uh, take it off, yeah. It's stuck it. on there, but it's it's not paste, you know, it's not glued on. So, the, so yeah, they say charcoal. Uh, they said the campfires down at the Mayan, campfires from the Aztecs and the Mayans are still greener, so they you know they said they can find areas in Central America that are really green. This this small spot that's really green, they'll dig down there to find a prehistoric campfire. They'll find the charcoal from that campfire. Um, so hot wildfires can do too. You get a real hot wildfire going, and the centers of the tree trunks just incinerate to charcoal. The outer side, you know, outer portions go to ash, but the inner portions go to charcoal. So a super hot wildfire can do it. 
volcanoes do it real easily. Uh, campfires can do it too with those big logs that they use. But charcoal is the main way to make your soil richer. Charcoal is real expensive because, well, around here they wouldn't let you just have a bunch of smoke being made. <laughs> so it's artificially expensive in the United States, but they still can make it. They, most of the charcoal is made in Asia where they just, you know, they allow. So what they do is they say to make it cheap, they'll just take a whole bunch of organic matter, like a crop they just harvested, like, say, a bunch of um, uh, sugar cane stalks. Light them on fire, get them really hot, and just bulldoze dirt over the whole thing. So it takes out all the oxygen, so they get a lot of charcoal underneath that, and they can sell the charcoal cheaply to the United States. That's biochar. Um, so that's how they make it. That's how the third world countries make their soil richer, is they'll, they'll just gather all the crop in one big pile, light it up, and then bury it. And, uh, and then they spread that out. Now, in California, they used to burn the rice fields after they harvested the rice, but the city of Sacramento told them can't do that. So now they have to throw it away. They can't bury it. They found out when they buried the dead rice stalks without burning them, it, poised, it created all that sewer gases on the next crop. So they have to throw it away into the landfills. So... Yes. Well, there's no ideal combination. It's just what you want. So if you filled it with pumice, the plants will grow like a weed, except you'll have to water them every two hours. And, you know, you fill them with sand, they'll throw real, real fast, water every day. Uh, or, you know, you can water several times a day if it's real coarse sand. So it just depends what you want. Uh, decomposed granite holds water better than sand does. Sandy loam holds water better than decomposed granite does. Uh, but things will grow f slower in the denser the soil. So, you know, <laughs> like they say up in Napa Valley, the hills there are clay and the, near the riverbeds, it's sand. The grapes grow faster and ripen earlier in the sandy soils than they do on the clay hills. So it's not a, you know, it's not a problem for them. It's just the way that plants grow is they, they develop much faster in sandy soils, but then they require more irrigation. So you can do whatever you want. You know, that's hydroponics. If you want to water every couple hours, you just grow them in something that you get the fastest growth out of. All of them, well, okay, so the sandier the soil, the coarser it is, the less that, that heat is transmitted through it. So, but normal soils, yeah, if, you, if soils are bare, uh, they can heat up pretty badly a foot deep. Like they said, they measure the temperature in, in bare soil in an orchard down in Texas, 90 degree day, the soil temperature a foot deep was 120 degrees which is too hot for the roots of that citrus tree. So they found out if they put three inches of, of some kind of coarse mulch on top, it can be gravel, it can be wood, it can be bark. It doesn't transmit the heat so well. The soil temperature foot deep was 85 degrees, which is ideal for plant roots. So the natural mulch on the surface of the ground is there for insulation. The soil itself can do it if it's coarser, but it's if it's fine textured, the, the heat is transmitted through it too well. So, but in but it's still, you know, they it still helps from the cold. So that I mean, cold is worse than heat uh, for a lot of plants. So, as they say, you know, we don't have any permafrost in the lower 48 states unless you're on top of Mount Whitney or something like that. So the soil keeps the roots of plants from freezing, which is real important. Um, but still, yeah, if you cover your ground, it's even better. So 
and that's the importance of that. Well, uh, a few inches at least of, of organic mineral on top. That's why we brought in this um, straw, because the straw is easier to move on top of the ground than, say, bark is or wood chips. So this is a wheat straw. And this is the only uh, compost or organic matter we can get that's all green waste. <laughs> you know, it's brown now, but it's it's from the leaves or the green parts of a plant rather than bark or wood that's from the trunk of a tree which doesn't have as much nutrients as the green parts of the plant did. The green parts have more of you know nitrogen and other things than the wood parts do. I don't know they you know they they have compost made out of wood it's like how nutritious can that be? And wood has a lot of calcium in it but not not a whole lot of all the other minerals. Leaves have all those micronutrients that plant, plants need. Okay, so we're, you know, we're trying to prevent you from having to buy this, but we do have you know, our top pot and our acid soils were created for pots so that they act like real dirt but they're lighter than sand is for pots. But we do have customers who use this to fill their planter beds for growing vegetables. I mean, you have to have some money to do that because you know, if you buy that and a whole bunch of that, it's still running about um, eight, uh, $16. If you buy a huge amount of that, it's still running $16 per cubic foot. Whereas if you buy, and if you have a pickup truck, then everything gets really cheap. If you buy decomposed granite per cubic foot in a pickup truck, it is about $3 per cubic foot. So a lot, lot cheap. That's what, five times cheaper? To buy this in bulk. And we can, we can get this in bulk but it's still really expensive because the stuff we make our, so our, our um, I didn't mention that, but our soil replacement, soil substitute, this is pumice, perlite, peat moss, sand, and charcoal in here. Well, I should mention, there is a cheaper substitute for charcoal. So that's, granular humic acids. So this is a, quote, a coal deposit from Texas. So there's a coal deposit that runs from Texas to the east coast of the United States. It actually appears in England, same coal deposit. <laughs> it's the same thing. Coal is made out of tree bark. So sometime in the distant past, a whole bunch of trees lost their bark and formed this, you know, they said they only find bark in this, in coal deposits. It's really, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. You have to kind of think it through to figure out how that happened. But uh, in Texas, there's this coal deposits, it's old tree bark. It's not been, you know, it's, I guess down underground, it gets heated up. So it's, it's non-reactive. It doesn't decompose any further. So it acts like charcoal. Um, and it's cheaper because it's just mined out of the ground. So that's this, the other name for this is leonardite or humic acids. And most of our, a lot of the fertilizer products on the shelf have this in them because it makes their fertilizers work better. So almost all the docked earth and down earth products have humic acids in them. Grow power is almost, you know, that's, uh, well, that's just, Grow Power, which unfortunately their company went out of business, I heard. But Grow Power was just pure humic acids infused with some chemical fertilizers. So uh, this, essentially you're buying charcoal for your ground, which makes everything grow better. So that's a cheaper way to get charcoal in your ground than buying actual charcoal. Right now, I don't have a, my source of charcoal, pure charcoal is, is out of stock. So you don't have to add much. I mean, again, 
uh, one to two percent. Here it says vegetable garden, one to two pounds per hundred square feet. Holds it forever. So we did a test once where we just sprinkled this stuff on top of some container plants. And within a month, the top of the soil was growing algae on it. <laughs> You know, the plants, uh, you know, this stuff was starting to grow on top of the ground where you put this. It just holds the minerals right there, so. Whereas in all the other plants, the algae wouldn't grow in there, but when we had this stuff sprinkled on top, the algae would start growing. So plants like to grow in that stuff. Um, the other things you can do to your soil, so we know we're low in potassium. So the ground in Orange County, the natural soil in Orange County um, supposedly has enough phosphorus in it that you never have to add phosphorus because we've seen the soil analysis to about 20 different soil samples all across Orange County were sent the results from a soil company and they said yeah in Orange County most soils in Orange County there's a lot of phosphorus in the ground so in plants There are 17 minerals that plants require, but uh, the major ones, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and oxygen are in water and air, so you don't need those. But you do need uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, Sulfur. Well, there's 17 of them anyway. There's seven, four, 14 minerals you need to add or make sure the ground has enough of our source to your plants. Now, again, compost like chicken manure or these types of compost can supply that. But uh, Orange County soils do have enough phosphorus in them that you don't have to worry about it. We don't have enough potassium, and if you just wanted to add that, potassium doesn't, so phosphorus is attracted to the soil particles really highly, so if you never have to add phosphorus to the ground. You might have to add them to pots, but not to the ground in most areas of Orange County. Potassium is, um, this langbanite is a natural source of potassium. If you want to just add that, K stands for potassium. If you want to add it once, that's fine. I mean, this last, the ground holds on to potassium pretty well. Uh, you'd only have to apply it every 20 years if you wanted to do that part of it. The nitrogen is not is too mobile. So there's no way you can ever hold enough nitrogen in your soil. You just have to keep adding it as a compost or as an, uh, another source of more concentrated fertilizer. So. If your soil is brown, that's your iron content. This has some iron in it. So. it the only other thing that you can do that makes sense is gypsum. So gypsum is calcium sulfate. Um, near, If you live near the ocean, this is recommended a lot because Calcium sulfate will release sodium. So if you live near the ocean, there's a lot of sodium coming in from this, the evaporated seawater, and that makes your soil sticky and slimy. Uh, if you put gypsum on them, the calcium will replace, allow the sodium to escape. So if you put gypsum on the ground there, they said if you put gypsum on the surface and irrigated it, it, this calcium will take the place of the sodium. The sodium gets washed out. So you get rid of your sodium that way. Inland, it doesn't do that. But calcium is still an important nutrient for the wood of trees. So if you have an orchard, calcium is also an important nutrient to finish off fruit. 
So you, if you want to have apples without the um, brown spots in them, which is called, uh, I can't remember the term, and tomatoes is the blossom end rot. You also get blossom end rot on peppers, uh, sometimes squash, uh, from lack of calcium in the soil. So make sure you have enough calcium in there by adding gypsum to the ground. But the fruit tree companies tell us, keep telling people, calcium on their fruit trees every year. Calcium is actually more in, in trees, there's more calcium in trees than there is phosphorus. So it is a, a pretty important mineral to have around. That's what the, the farms do, the orchards do that. You could, in containers, certainly, yeah. But yeah, farms, they say uh, avocado orchards especially add, I think uh, our supplier of avocados said they use something like 30 pounds per tree per year, which means they're bringing in truck, uh, train car loads of gypsum in their orchards. I mean, sometimes we get an avocado tree from them and there's just a handful of, of gypsum right on top of the root ball of the avocado tree, they say, that the gypsum and calcium in it uh, helps uh, prevent root rot. And they don't know why it works, so. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of people out there telling you to make a lasagna garden, pile up newspaper and sticks and twigs and all this stuff underneath the dirt. So that's, so, you know, the first year you do this, even the first few years, you got great airflow in your soil. So you might get good results initially, but once that wood product starts breaking down, I don't know that you can repair that after that. So that's the problem with all this organic matter going in the ground. You have to be careful. If it's on top of the ground, that's what nature does. Again, so it's much safer to do it that on top. And again, uh, some of the products that we sell to do the organic matter on top, uh, the garden straw, you know, not as much nutrition in garden straw, but still uh, a nice organic layer to have on top of the ground. We sell a lot of chicken manure nowadays because chicken manure is one of the few things that qualify as fertilizer that has a skyrocket in price because it is a uh, waste product. Um, Serum manure would be also this similar, uh, not quite as concentrated as chicken manure, but the problem with a lot of the steer manure, especially if it's dairy cows, loaded with sodium. So we don't sell um, steer manure because back in the day when Bandini, if you remember the name Bandini from the 1960s and 70s and 80s, they said that their stir manure was 10% sodium by weight. So that was their warning to us. So we, we just stay away from stir manure. Uh, what they said that happens is dairy cows are fed a lot of salt. It raises their blood pressure. They make more milk. We do like this product, uh, Garden Compost, from this company. Um, it's one of the few products where we see one of the ingredients on here is green waste. I, haven't, I don't know of any other product I can get that has, quote, green waste in it versus just either manures or um, wood products or, bar, you know, uh, recycled stuff from the sawmill. So it's wood products, rice hulls, green waste, chicken manure in that one. And then our, the top of the line compost source would be like this happy frog. And this has got okay, it's here somewhere. Okay, 
Uh, okay, uh, well, this one, this one's not the same as the other one out there. Yeah, it should be. 85 to 9%, 5% aged forest products and fertilizers derived from earthworm castings, bat guano, oyster shell, and dolomite and lime. Yeah, I actually like this one better. So you would compost only for vegetable crops where you're turning that soil over? Or am I understanding it incorrectly where I thought you said do not compost? Well, don't put it in the ground. Just leave it on top. The farms have to turn it in laid on top. So all this organic matter, lay it on top. Try not to mix it with the dirt below it. I mean, there's going to be some mixing, but try to keep it separate from the soil below it. This stuff decomposes. These three things will decompose very quickly. So you, you know, after one crop, you you pull this stuff off the top of it. You may not see it left at all. It may have already disappeared, because all this stuff can decompose pretty quickly. So. So that's the goal is to keep them separate. If you can keep them separate, it's better. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, plant leaves, you know, plant leaves are the ideal thing to use for compost. Because that's what Nate, that's basically what nature is, is dead leaves on the ground. So in the 1980s, there was a published report by UC Davis saying that they went around the Central Valley, California to see how the different soils affected the different forms of plant life that were growing naturally in the Central Valley. And they said, <clears throat> apparently it doesn't matter. The same plants grew throughout the Central Valley, whether it was sandy soil, clay soil, rocky soil. They said the plants weren't, the plants they were serving, which were a lot of native shrubs and trees, were not using the soil for nutrition at all. They were living wherever a pile of dead leaves was. That was their source of nutrition. The dead leaves on the top of the ground was what they were, what, where they were getting their nutrition from. And the way it happens, um, so a lot of people think things have to be composted in the compost pile first. Well, most of nature doesn't recycle that way. It's through a mycorrhizal fungus. So, I mean, composting still happens, but all this dead stuff on top, we call it the duff layer of the ground. And again, it can be anywhere from zero to five foot deep, really. Um, a friend of mine went down to Guatemala and they were digging up underneath the avocado trees. Said, there was five foot of dead leaves underneath these trees. So the duff layer, which we think is short for dead stuff, but um, this is where the decomposition is happening. Uh, now plants in the ground have a symbiotic partner. And they said it's been on plants since they emerged from the ocean. Um, when they emerged from the ocean, 200 two billion years ago? I don't know. Can't, I don't know the, the dates anymore, but this fungus has partnered up with plants. They say when plants came on land, they couldn't dissolve the rock. So they needed this fungus to help them dissolve the rocks and get the nutrients out. So there's this fungus that lives attached to the plant's roots that goes up and eats up the dead stuff on top of the ground. So if you have a lot of dead stuff piled on top of the ground, You'll see all this white hyphae from the mycorrhizal fungus in it. And it's taking the nutri nutrients from that directly back into the roots of the plant. The closed system. So they said most of nature's recycling is done by the mycorrhizal fungus. And this mycorrhizal fungus can break down and take the nutrients out of a dead leaf that falls on the ground back into the same plant as quickly as 90 days is what they found out. So, so feeder, what they call feeder roots, this is, works in combination with the feeder roots or is it part <laughs> of the feeder roots? Yeah, apparently. They, well, what they found out in the 1960s, because they didn't know, they thought, 
they found out that 80% of the root system of the tree was the fungus hyphae. They thought they were feeder roots. And it's the fungus attached to the root tree's roots. They said the, the tree's roots were 80% fungus and the rest of it was the tree. So the fungus is attached to the feeder roots. Or it is the feeder roots, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's why you, you don't want to do that. No, because you're messing up the fung, the mycorrhiza fungi. It's so, getting cut. So don't follow the directions on the box. Right, I just like to throw it on top. And it won't break down. Right. Right. And you know, some of these mycorrhizal fungus, you'll, you'll know the names, truffles are a type of mycorrhizal fungus that lives on oak trees in Europe and gets the nutrients from the oak leaves back into the tree. Now there's a few crops that don't like the mycorrhizal fungus, so just know that. So if you're growing anything in the Brassicaceae Bres family, the also known as Cupharaceae, the uh, bro broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, uh, radishes, um, they are used to living in soil that's been disturbed by the riverbeds and they don't like mycorrhizal fungi. They'd rather do it themselves. Uh, so if you're, if you're growing those crops, it's actually better to till the soil right before you grow them. Mess up that mycorrhizal fungi for a while because they don't, they're not, they're, they're particularly, they don't really want that around. Uh, now, most grass crops like corn, uh, wheat, they can go either way. They, they, can, they can do this by themselves with the bacteria in the ground, or they can work with the mycorrhizal fungi. But the brassicaceae do not like the mycorrhizal around, so they want you to till that, your farm up. Most other crops, they want you to leave that soil as is. Don't till it, just plant. And if you really want to be a good farmer, don't throw anything away. Uh, you can, you know, make your plants look, a little, your dead plants look a little better, chop them up a little bit, throw them back on the ground, let the next crop work with it. Uh, and that's why we have to rotate crops too. So make sure you rotate crops. Um, the farm we were next to, we, we leased land from them for four years. They told us they were on a 10 crop rotation cycle. The four years we were there, we didn't see them plant the same thing in the same soil twice. So their 10 crop rotation took at least four years. And that's because if you plant, say, straw, you know, strawberries was their main money-making crop, you'll leave a bunch of dead strawberry roots in the ground afterwards, which can mess up any new strawberry plant growing in there. If you plant corn in there, corn doesn't care if there's a dead strawberry plant in the ground. If you grow beans in there, it doesn't care either. So they keep track of what they grow and they don't plant strawberries again for the next four years. By that four years, they expect all the dead roots of the strawberry plant to be gone. So it's a clean bill of health again for that soil. So it's not, you know, uh, unfortunately some people still will tell you, oh, it's because we took something out of the ground that we can't replace. Well, we know what you, what, how to replace it. You, know, you put dead plants on top of the ground, you've replaced every mineral that that plant needs. All plants have those same minerals in them. Um, you can't not replace it. I mean, that's, you know, we still hear that on, on a lot of research, uh, research reports. You know, you, the farm crops are being grown in depleted soil. No, <laughs> you know, the farmers know how to re-enrich the soil. You just put the dead stuff back on top. I mean, you know, the farmers get in either um, recycled sludge or you know, the, or the you know, smaller farms will put just dead plants on top of the ground. You've got all your minerals in that. You're not depleting the soil. The soil itself doesn't have that much in it to begin with. So, any questions on this stuff? So, crop rotation is real important. Keeping track of what you plant where. Make sure you don't uh, plant the same thing in the same place too often. Um, Right. right. 
So if you're a conventional farmer, they work with chemical fertilizers and chemical fertilizers are soluble at certain pHs. So if your pH is too low, the phosphorus is not available. If it's too high, the iron's not available and, and the uh, nitrogen's not so available. So if you're working with chemical fertilizers, you have to watch the pH. If you work with organics, it doesn't seem to matter at all. Uh, now certain plants, we know the plants really need like highly acidic conditions for blueberries. We know you, know, you gotta have that high acidity for them. But most plants, if you are orga using organic fertilizers, uh, you shouldn't have to worry about the pH very much because nature doesn't. So. So you've got that mycorrhizal fungi. Maybe I should spell that. Um, so that's your main recycler nature. It's supposed to be faster than compost piles with the bacteria decomposition. So. Right. I mean, you know, in the Central Valley, when they did that survey, they said different pHs, different everything, the plant, the same plants grew. It depends on the crop again, but uh, most plants aren't, you know, it's not a big issue because they still get their fertilizer from this system, the mycorrhizal system. Well, you can if you're using, especially if you're using chemical fertilizers. I mean, most plants that we grow are from an acidic environment. You know, if there's enough rain to grow this plant that we're growing, usually the soil is more acidic. So, uh, you know, high rainfall washes out the alkaline salts, so the soils end up being acidic. So, yeah, our soils on the West Coast tend to be naturally slightly alkaline. So if you want to and make it more acidic, it's, that's what most plants are used to that we're growing. Very few plants you know, are native to the West Coast. <laughs> I think tomatoes are native to the West Coast of uh, South America, though, so they can probably handle it. Yes? Yeah, it was this, well, it was richer. They considered clay soil the rich soil. So it, it retained the moisture, and clay does retain some minerals better than sand does. Well, I think, I think uh, beans are a little more drought resistant than other crops, too. But, yeah, I, I don't know the whole story behind that. Any other questions? I think I covered everything. Oh, okay. If you want to bring your your pH down, uh, the cheapest way to do it was with soil sulfur. So there's a bacteria in the ground that feeds on sulfur, and its poop is hydrosulfuric acid. So if you put sulfur in the ground, you will acidify your soil. And it tells you here how much to put on. If, you're, if your soil pH is, if you have clay soil and your pH is seven and you want to get it down, uh, add eight and three quarter pounds of this per 100 square feet. Well, this is five pounds. So this will only do about 75 square feet of clay soil. If you want to get it down to 4.5, which is the range for blueberries. So it's hard to work with this in small areas. It's just hard to figure that out. And I will mention that 
among the organics, the only th organic matter that I would approve for the ground besides charcoal would be rice hulls. So rice hulls, the hulls off of rice kernels, um, is almost, they said it's 90% silica. And they just don't decompose. They're, they said you can go to some of the levees around Sacramento where they put the rice holes into the levees from 50 years ago and you can reach down in there and pull them out of there and they look fresh. So rice holes are one way to make the soil lighter and more airy without ruining the, the future of that soil. And peat moss we consider not so bad. You don't really need to use it, except it does lower the pH a bit. It does help sandy soils hold more moisture, which is not really a big issue since we have automatic watering systems. But we consider peat safe because it's been sitting at the bottom of the lake for thousands of years. It doesn't seem to have a disease reaction. It doesn't seem to decompose fast enough to cause a lot of trouble. Pure peat doesn't breed though. So just be aware of that. If you have pure peat moss, the plants won't, it won't kill the plants. They can't grow roots very deep because it doesn't have any air penetration and it acts like clay. But it is acidic rather than being alkaline. So that's one reason why you might want to put peat moss in the ground to make the soil acidic. This is another way to do it. Uh, but this can do it pretty much without penalty too. This is more expensive than this. Let's see. No, we don't like coco core. So coco core doesn't decompose so fast. It's like peat moss that decomposes slowly. But coco core is really fresh material. It's, it was just a, they just killed something and we think it's loaded with tannins, uh, which are things that all plant materials have in them to prevent things from attacking them. You know, it's like redwood is flow with tannins to prevent um, fungus and bacteria from eating the wood. So redwood decomposes real slowly, but that makes plants turn a funny color. So when we've grown things in coconut core, and we've, we've tried it, they come out a funny color. We don't know if that's hurting the plant or not, but it sure looks really weird. I mean, we, we know of a grower down in Vista, Fallbrook, that grows their avocado trees in coconut core. And we bought some from them, brought them to our store, and you put them next to ours, they're still green, but they look orange green. I mean, it's really odd, the color that they turn. So we don't think the, that's good for the plants. Otherwise, looks reasonable. I mean, well, no one, no one can grow plants like we can grow them in our soil, but, but it looked okay, but it was orange. <laughs> I mean, really odd color. And we've seen that whenever we use coconut core, it turns out funny color, so we don't trust it. We, it's got to have some tannins or chemicals in it that are causing that, just like redwood does. Redwood causes that too. Um, but it doesn't seem to kill the plants, but it turns them funny colored. Um, so we're not real happy. We know coconut core, you know, just like peat moss, within a year or so, nothing can grow in it by itself because it breaks down slightly and it doesn't breathe anymore. So coconut core is used you know, in hot houses for growing certain crops, but they, it's gotta be a seasonal crop, you know, a fast turning crop, because it's not a, a good permanent soil. I mean, our top pot potting soil, we made to be permanent. It's two thirds permanent material, so it'll continue to breathe down the road. Um, I mean, there's, you know, perlite is this man-made pumice it's, it's popped quartz. Volcanoes do that. We, we do this. So it's essentially the same material. Uh, vermiculite is popped clay. So if you have you know gravel for soil, you can add vermiculite to it. It's like adding clay. So you can't really grow things in here too long because this gets really slimy after it breaks down for a while. But uh, it works for a while. Do 
give it that parity? Um, should I be pouring in from the end in there and working it in there, or how can I? So if you buy some, yeah, if you buy anything called garden soil, you just throw that away and start over. You can use the garden soil as a surface mulch, because it, all it is is nutrition. It, there's really no soil in it, so you grow plants in it maybe for a few months, and then it's all downhill from there. So they yeah, that stuff they call garden soil, raised bed soil. It can work for one crop at most, and then it's totally worthless because it doesn't breathe well enough for the roots after that. So, so. there's no fixing, it's just better to start over. Or use it, as, well you can, you can use it as a mulch on top, but you really can't make it work as a growing medium anymore. I mean that soil I bought that was 40% compost, I took, it took me 10 years to change it all. So you know that's how I, it got ingrained to me. You know, after 10 years of doing this, I, I know for certain I, to never do it again. So when I dug, when I was digging it out, what I was noticing is because I had trees planted in there, that the tree roots were maybe one root. Well, okay, it was funny. The tree roots grew on top of the soil quite well because there was air there, and they grew underneath it in my natural clay really well because it was safer there. But in it, there's like one root every six inches through this 40% compost soil. That was all they can do. I replaced that soil with sandy loam, this stuff. And a half year later, I checked it again around these trees. One root every quarter inch in there. So that's 24 times more root in this density than in the compost with this. And that's what the compost was doing to it. It didn't have enough oxygen to support more than one twenty-fourth of the roots that was supposed to be there. So yeah, so you really, it's really hard to fix that. I mean, I you know at forty percent compost, I wasn't about to try fixing it. Uh, I just threw it all away. It had an odor to it. It had an odor. It wasn't. It wasn't a. Uh, sewer odor because it wasn't I didn't keep it saturated but it had an odor and they and the compost people tell me yeah, if you're slightly low on oxygen the compost makes acids and that's what I was smelling I was smelling the acidity of my soil so I would just pull it out dump it in buckets dump it in a trash bin and I could smell the you know acrid odor to that soil that I was pulling out of there and I got down to the gray clay that was natural and I knew at that point that's all I had to do and then I brought in this and piled it on top. Mm -hmm. That's about the only way out. Sometimes Lowe's has it in bags but it's heavy. It's heavier than sand. You know so it's uh, but yeah I would go down to I had a pickup truck and go down to a building supply. One scoop would overload my pickup truck for about in those days it was only about forty five fifty dollars for one whole pickup load of dirt. Uh, now it's more like 60, 70 bucks for a pickup load of dirt, but it's still way cheaper than buying it in bags. Anytime you bag up the same product, it's three times more expensive. Well, you can plant things in clay. There's no problems as long as the clay doesn't have organic matter buried in there with it. And you'll get good results, especially if you raise it up. But if you want to fix it, you can either, yeah, put sandy loam right on top of it, or you can make raised beds and fill them with sandy loam, or you can dig out your clay and replace it with sandy loam. That's... Yeah. That's good for your house. <laughs> Not so good for your plants. So. Yeah. Again, we've had people take off one to two foot of their natural clay soil and replace it with sandy loam. And I would say DG is probably safer just in case you get a, a weed filled batch of sandy loam. So, and as costs on sandy loam and DG, decomposed granite's the same. That's, that's the lowest price dirt you can buy. Uh, one of our former employees, Rick Carrasco, used to 
always for all his planting jobs, he was a landscaper on the side or on top of that. He would use a mix of sandy loam and decomposed granite. And one of the local companies, Larry's Building Materials, would always mix that together for him. They did it so often they started calling it Rick's Mix. And he did my mom's yard back in the 90s. And he, she had clay soil. He put that much of his Rick's Mix on top of her clay soil. And suddenly a whole bunch of trees in the yard started growing really fast. <laughs> They loved to have that as a root, rooting area because they couldn't live too well in the clay. So they suddenly just started taking off and growing. And then he covered it with a quarter inch of chicken manure. And we couldn't believe it. All the stuff in my mom's yard just was growing like weeds. I mean, we had to pull out half the plants because there was just too much plant growth in her backyard <laughs> after he did that. So that works too. Just eight inches on top of clay is good enough for most plants. Oh yeah, that'd work. Well, for cost, it's about the most effective way to put nutri nutrients in the ground or provide nutrients for your plants. Uh, well, that'll that'll help. I mean, this straw supposedly has natural. They, they, the, the claim is from this company that if once you get it wet a few times, it kind of sticks to itself and doesn't blow as easy. But yeah, netting on top would work too, or just something heavier. Okay, all right, thank you.